about arborists and basically what I do is I go out on properties, residential property, properties mainly, and make evaluations of trees and shrubs um, and make recommendations to take care of the people's trees. Um, what I look for, I mean, we do a lot of pruning in all aspects of tree care, but we do a lot of insect and disease suppression. So, um, so that's what I'll be talking about. Today's, uh, the insects and diseases that I'm focusing on today are really what we're starting to see more recently, um, or that's been more active this year, what I've found. So. Um, some of the insects and diseases that I'll be talking about, uh, or that we've really been seeing a lot of this year, uh, the spotted lanternfly, uh, scale insects have been just a huge problem across the board. Fall webworm um, is a, a caterpillar that we're seeing a lot of this year. Wood boring insects, and there's a lot of different ones that I'll go into. Um, those are some of the insects. As far as the diseases, the foliar diseases have just been crazy, uh, mostly fungal diseases in the early spring as well as late season foliar diseases. Uh, fire blight. Uh, root rot, and then needle cast, which is um, generally on your evergreens. So a lot of times when I go out to a property, the first thing I have to do is kind of be, um, I'll get a question or somebody will come out and say, my tree's dying, what's wrong with it? Well, you've got to start and ask a lot of questions. It may not be obvious as far as what the problem is. So it's kind of like being a doctor, you know, you want to ask, what are your symptoms? What are you seeing? So it's a little bit of, you know, I said, being a detective, ask a lot of questions. If you have the client there or the homeowner there uh, to be able to answer them, they may or may not know or may be able to help you out, but it may not always be obvious as far as just a, a one problem. So the main thing though, when you're out there looking at a problem, you gotta be able to identify the plant. So just making sure you have the right plant, um, that, you, that you know what the plant is, that'll eliminate or you'll be able to narrow down your focus on a lot of insects and diseases, whichever way it goes. And then observe the surroundings around it. You know, a lot of times I'll look at a tree and it's declining and I'll see a nice patch of sod you know, new sod that's been put down. So what that indicates, or the first question I'll ask is, why is this new sod here? And what happened for you all to put all this sod? And a lot of times it'll be a trench and they've trenched right next to the tree, which would uh, cause root damage and cause the tree to decline. So <clears throat> wanted to, talk about a little bit of the difference between signs and symptoms. Here you've got a red maple um, in a parking lot. Very common scenario, you see where the top is starting to die back. Um, so some of the signs or the symptoms are the tip die back. Uh, can't really tell by that picture, but you've got smaller leaves. They haven't matured. If on the growth of that tree, it wasn't really flushing out a lot of growth. So it's like, huh, what's wrong with it? Well, you can see that it's a limited root zone. It's got a small space, so water, but it just didn't look right. All right, so we were talking about symptoms and signs on that maple tree in the parking lot. Um, the symptoms are tip dieback, poor growth, and the small leaves. Um, the signs are, once I walked closer to that tree, I found that it was just covered in gloomy scale, which is an insect. And that's why it was dying back so badly. So <clears throat> all of those little dots on the tree, on the, it's not the bark. This is a red maple and other than it's starting to get a coarser bark, but that bark is very smooth. So all that texture that you see are thousands of scale insects. And this particular type of scale is called gloomy scale. And it's pretty prevalent in urban areas and um, we're seeing just a tremendous amount of it. It's always on stress trees uh, in parking lots like this, but I'm seeing it much more so 
in the landscape or around even on you know nicer properties or not nicer properties bigger properties where they have plenty of space um, this is another uh, this is a tree it's a Siberian elm with a ton of fruiting bodies or mushrooms on the base of it and when you first look at it it's like wow you know what is that is it coming from the tree is it coming from the lawn um, so I saw that, and this actually, those fruiting bodies are armillaria root rot. And when I saw that, I knew that that tree was going to be in big trouble, and I recommended to take it down. And they didn't take it down right away. They were going to, but within the next week or two, that tree blew over. Um, it affects the, the roots that quickly. It's called shoestring root rot. Um, so that was a sign or a symptom of the root rot, those fruiting bodies. It was following a root, yep. Um, it's also called honey brown. Uh, if you had peeled the bark off of this tree, which it'll often flake once it becomes dead, you'll see the, um, why it's called shoestring is you'll see the fibrous roots from the, the mycelium from the disease. But yeah, they follow the roots. And this whole tree, it just, it blew. I mean, it, it blew over. There was no root zone at all. That specific, so there's, you know, mushrooms, different diseases or different decays, not diseases, will have different mushrooms. So the type of mushroom, if you can identify the mushroom, you can identify the disease. Um, that particular for shoestring root rot or armillaria, it'll always look like that. And it's kind of a uh, orangish honey, honey color. It's actually an edible mushroom. It's really good. It's one of the few edible. Um, I ate a lot of that. So, um, all right. So that's the difference between the signs and the symptoms. I thought I would start out with that. Um, now we'll talk about some of the other diseases and insects that I'm seeing. Uh, flowering pears are still a really important tree or common tree. I don't know how important they are, but you see them a lot in the landscape. Not as much, I guess, as they used to be because of all the problems that they have. Um, but people still like to plant them. They grow fast. They have nice color. Uh, they flower every year and they're pretty consistent about that. You know, like some plants don't always have good flowering pears do. So that's why they were so, uh, so popular. The problem is, is they've become overplanted. They're a very weak tree. So they tend to break apart once they get mature. And initially when they were introduced from the nursery, they were supposed to be sterile and not produce fruit. Well, they started producing fruit and that's why they became invasive. But they also have a lot of problems, and the main one is fire blight, um, which is a disease that they'll get. And <clears throat> what it'll cause is that shoot dieback, where it happens early to mid spring, or you know, uh, excuse me, mid to late spring. And it's not only on um, it's not only on pear trees, but it'll affect other trees like apple trees, crab apples, uh, serviceberry, pyracantha, and hawthorn. Uh, it's a pretty aggressive disease, so if you get fire blight, it's hard to control it chemically, but culturally pruning it out is oft often beneficial. Did somebody have a question up there? Was that what that was when it came up? Oh, okay. All right. No, go ahead. Oh, you did? Yep. So this is just another picture um, of fire blight and it'll thin the plant out. Eventually, it'll, it'll kill the plant. So if you do prune it, you wanna prune the infection out well below the infected area. And the way you tell the difference is the tips will turn black. It almost looks like charcoal. Um, the stems will be just jet black, but you've gotta prune at least 10 to 12 inches below that infection area, or you'll just keep chasing the disease. So 
some good alternatives to flour and pears or calorie pears are uh, other mid-sized trees, crab apples, flowering cherries, uh, cayanthus, which is French tree, uh, crepe myrtle, and coosa dogwood. So um, Leland cypress is another plant that we see on the landscape a lot and they have their fair share of problems. Again, they've just become so overplanted. Uh, but the main thing that we see with those is the way that people plant them, if they don't space them properly, or if they're in an area that has poor air circulation, they'll get a disease called ceridium canker and it'll cause the plant to start dying out. Uh, <clears throat> the, if you look at the main trunk, you'll see a lot of sap or oozing on the trunk and eventually the tree will just slowly decline. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a treatment for that either. Uh, most cankers, there are, you can't do anything about other than culturally trying to keep the plant as healthy as possible through fertilization, uh, during a drought, don't let it dry out. That's when they'll really start showing the symptoms of you know, the stress. Um, <clears throat> you can actually thin them uh, through pruning and that'll increase the air circulation. So this is, these are Leland's again, and you can see the fruiting bodies here on the stem and then the canker itself where the bark starts to peel. Uh, when you see that, that's typically a canker or the ceridium canker. <clears throat> this is a mature hedge um, of Leland cypress and obviously pretty well infected. And that's what they start to look like. They'll just thin out to where they'll, you'll eventually lose the whole plant. So some of this actually might have been winter damage. I took that picture after we had a really cold winter, but they did have ceridium. And that's another problem with Leland cypress and most evergreens on a cold winter, they can turn to, they'll start turning brown because uh, they still are desiccating and transpiring through the winter. <clears throat> so again, that's the same thing, just more dieback. No, I have that many pictures of it. So as I mentioned, the best thing for Leland's, if you're gonna plant those, um, one thing is don't plant a monoculture. Uh, vary your plants if you just have one species. If a disease does move in, it can become infected. They like full sun, uh, but somewhat sheltered, not on top of a hill where they get a tremendous amount of wind. Uh, space them. Most people want instant screen, so they'll plant them too close together and that'll cause a lot of the problems. Uh, I mentioned already irrigating and then, um, and I talked about the planting parts, so. <clears throat> A lot of people don't think that they can prune the Leland's, um, but this is a before and after picture of the Leland's once they're thinned. And some of it was to cut out disease, but mostly just to space it. And culturally, that's something that you can do to help the plant just get better air circulation to reduce the amount of disease in the plant. <clears throat> My little picture didn't show up. So we'll switch gears and talk about boxwoods now. Um, boxwoods have always been kind of a historical plant around here. When I, especially when I first started with this company or with Bartlett and uh, on some of the landscapes around here, just huge boxwood gardens, um, primarily English, well, both English and American. And over the years, I think, I've only got maybe one or two nice English gardens that I, I work on because of the boxwood decline. Um, but the Americans, and then there was cultivars of other boxwoods just thrived. Well, now there's a new disease, well, it's new to this area um, called boxwood blight that has really caused a lot of concern for boxwoods. And then boxwoods in general, it's a, they're a tough plant. People are kind of afraid of them or think that they're really tender, they're not. It's a hardy plant. 
but they're just they get a lot of pro or they have a lot of problems. So, oh, there it is. <laughs> so, the reason why there's a deer there, it's one of the few uh, plants in this area that are actually resistant to deer browsing. So, <laughs> so because there aren't many, even the ones that say that they're resistant, they're not. But I've never seen a deer eat eat boxwood. Um, so. So this is a garden, um, obviously, that has a large number of boxwoods, and they're really starting to die out. Some of these are, this is probably boxwood decline, and I'll go into decline later. Um, honestly, I can't tell. <clears throat> I think most of these are American. So I didn't take this picture, and I don't know the, the back history with it. But I think um, there's probably root rot issues going on with, with these plants. So <clears throat> most, the one thing about boxwoods is they don't like water. It's a plant that really likes a dry site. So picking the right location for them is really important. Um, not irrigating them or over irrigating them, that'll cause a lot of problems but usually it's root rot that is the main cause of boxwood decline and boxwood death. The other thing, and this was prior to boxwood blight. Now if boxwood blight moves in, that's a, a very aggressive fungus that spreads rapidly uh, and it can spread just by the spores on the, like if you brush up against them, they can stick on your clothes and so they can be spread very easily, especially landscapers or people that mow lawns. If they go from one place to the other, that's how the disease can spread. Uh, they say even birds can spread the disease. Um, this is boxwood psyllid, that white um, fluffy stuff you see. That's common in the early spring, right when the new growth is coming out. And it's more like a little aphid. But if you've ever seen on boxwoods where the leaves cup, they get in tight little circles, the leaves, that's what causes that as it, as it matures. That's the reaction to the plant. Very easy to control. And it really doesn't damage. I mean, it's more aesthetic damage than actual um, really hurting the plant, but easy to control. This is called volutella. I'm seeing a tremendous amount of this. Um, volutella is a fungus. It's a very weak pathogen that affects uh, boxwoods. It doesn't move quickly, but you'll just see these random dieback, these areas that'll start to die back. The best thing to do is just prune them out. Um, I get a lot of calls, um, people thinking that they have boxwood blight when it's volutella. The best way to tell it apart from blight is on the underneath side of the leaf, on that other picture, you can see the black spores on the back side of the leaf. And if you see that, that's volutella. Um, treating it with a fungicide helps, but the results have been kind of sketchy with that. So really pruning it out's the best thing. Now this is a, sh a boxwood hedge that has boxwood blight. and <clears throat> From my experience where I've seen it, once it starts, it happens. That disease spreads very quickly and will really defoliate the plants. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the leaves, it may be on one side of the plant. Uh, it may be on, you know, a lot of times boxwoods are along the foundation of the house. And I've seen it where it's on the back side where they're more protected and then everything on the back side. I've seen it where it's on the front side. So I'm not really sure like why it spreads or how it spreads in that fashion. Um, but once you have it, you'll know it and it, it goes quickly. There are treatments for it. And initially when boxwood blight came out or we started seeing boxwood blight, which for us in this area was in 2018 was the first year when we had all that excessive rain. Uh, that was the first year I'd ever seen boxwood blight, and it really exploded. I mean, I'd, I treated boxwood blight all over the place. 
I've seen some new areas of infection this year, but it's been very low. So those are the symptoms of the blight. You first start seeing the um, necrosis or those dark tips on, or dark round spots on the, the healthy foliage. And you'll see that first. If you start to move <clears throat> or look at the stem of the plant, you'll start to see black streaking on the stem. Once you see that, it's, it's gotten pretty aggressive or it's gotten pretty far into the plant. And that's when it becomes a little bit harder to manage and you may have to start pulling out some of the plants so you don't spread it. And then that's just another, a better picture of it, that dark streaking that I'm talking about um, for, from boxwood blight. And obviously that picture is, you know, it's a sideways branch. <clears throat> So these were plants that we actually treated that were, as you can see on the left, they were pretty far gone. And we started treating, treating them with a fungicide and they came back. And the reason why I bring that up, and there's still a lot of controversy whether or not the treatments are effective, um, but I've seen enough of it in, in the lab and our, our the research shows that it does work. Unfortunately, it's a pretty aggressive treatment, meaning you have to treat, at, well, if it's an infected site, they recommend treating it twice a month for like six months. So it's a lot of treatments. <clears throat> but some of these gardens, I mean, that's their whole landscape, you know. But, but that's another plant there that was treated as well. So the main thing with boxwood blight, um, trying to avoid spreading the disease and from your plants to get them in general, uh, you know, just monitor for the symptoms, look for where it starts to defoliate. If you see that, um, you know, call somebody or, or get it tested, send it to Virginia Tech. Um, you may want to, depending on how bad the infection is, pull the plant out. If it's just isolated in one area, go ahead and pull that plant out and get rid of it. You're probably better off doing that. You know, it's where the whole, the whole hedge is infected, where you may want to try to start treatment if you catch it early enough. It just depends on the situation. Um, but you want to avoid pruning it, shearing especially. Uh, shearing is one of the main ways that this disease is being spread. Uh, irrigation, they don't, boxwoods do not like to have water splashing on them and then that'll spread the spores also. Uh, thinning the boxwood instead of shearing, allowing that air circulation is really key and important. Um, Saunders Brothers is a nursery down, um, gosh, I always forget where it is, but uh, if you looked them up, they're doing most of the research on boxwood blight and they've actually come out with a new plant or a new boxwood, a new variety that's completely resistant. Um, certain boxwoods now, like the English are most susceptible, American are a little bit less and the Japanese are even, well, certain Japanese boxwoods are more susceptible, but they have one, I believe it's called Generation X <laughs> that, um, and I, I'm pretty sure that's the name of it, but they, they've got some that they claim to be completely resistant. But Saunders Brothers Nursery is doing most of the research and a really good source if you're into boxwoods. That new variety? Honestly, I don't know the exact cross of what it is, but I believe, I think it is a cross between the American and the Korean. So, um, <clears throat> hemlock woolly adelgid is another pest um, that years ago, there was a lot of information about it because it's a, it was a non-native insect, uh, especially around here. The, um, 
the Limberlost Trail on Shenandoah National Park was just lined with with hemlock. So there's articles in the newspaper, and uh, the hemlocks were just dying from this pest. Well, some of the hemlocks survived, but here recently I'm seeing another uh, really big infestation of hemlock woolly adelgid. So all these little white um, spots along the, the base of the needle on the stem is the insect, and it almost looks like cotton. Um, but what will happen is it's, it's a feeding insect, and it, it sucks on the phloem of the plant, and then it'll cause the needles to drop and eventually to where it'll kill the plant. So it's a shame. I, I think hemlock's probably one of the prettiest evergreens we have in this area. And, you know, if they're left untreated, they, they can die from it. The treatments, there is a treatment. You can do a soil drench on it. It's very effective. And usually one treatment will last several years without reinfestation. But I don't know why all of a sudden the, um, all of a sudden I'm starting to see more of it which most insects do, they go in cycles. You have, yeah. So <clears throat> that's why I brought it back up. Um, four, huh. four adelgids per year, per inch, um, totally inhibits new growth. So a plant like this, I mean, that's covered. It won't take long at all for that tree to start to really thin out and defoliate. And if it's left alone, it, they usually die within four years. So that's just where they're, oh, they actually produce a toxin with their mouth part and in the tree itself. <clears throat> so um, this is just a, I think that was a state, actually, I took a picture of they were treating some and the hemlock woolly adelgid has two cycle or two generations per year. Um, and like I said, the, the treatments, they're very easy to control. It's just making sure you can identify them and getting on top of it before they become too big of a problem if you have hemlocks. <clears throat> and you'll only see it on the underneath side. You have to turn the, the branch over. If you look at it on the top, you generally won't see the plant unless it becomes really heavy. So. We talked about scale insects a little bit at the very beginning with those red maples. There's a lot of different types of scale insects. Um, and it's probably one of the toughest insects to control just because of the way they're, the, the structure of them. They've got a, a very hard outer coating and that coating's waxy. So uh, most insecticides and will just kind of repels off of the body of the insect. So being able to identify the type of scale that you're dealing with is really important because the most critical time or the, the best way to control this particular insect is when the, the babies are emerging because they're, they don't have that waxy covering yet. So the, these are all different types, Lacanium, Magnolia, Obscure, White Peach Scale or Prunicola Scale gloomy scale which was on that red maple tree japanese maple scale that is a, a scale that i don't think i have a picture of it um but it's a white scale it's like a little sliver and it's not species specific um to japanese maples i'm seeing japanese maple scale on just about every every plant now and it covers pretty quickly um and then i I included cottony camellia scale, uh, which is also not species specific to camellias. Uh, you'll see that on hollies and ewes, taxes. And this year was the worst year I've ever seen for, for cottony camellia scale. I think I have a picture of it. Yeah, that's it there. Um, and before it gets, that heavy on the plant, a lot of times, especially on hollies, uh, the scale will be on the underneath side of the leaf and people will call and say, oh, my holly tree is just turning black, all the leaves. And it's called sooty mold and that's from the excretion from the scale itself. 
So a lot of times people will come out and say, I've been spraying this plant with fungicide every day. Well, not every day, but you know, constantly. And I'm not getting anywhere. I said, well, it's not a, you're not controlling the problem. You know, you got to control the scale and that'll get rid of the sooty mold. So there's several different treatments. Most of them are foliar applications. Dormant oil is very effective. Um, there's soft scales and armored scales. The soft scales are a little bit easier to control because of that waxy covering versus the armored scales. Um, but then the other treatment that we use now that seems to be pretty effective is a growth regulator, not regulating the growth of the plant itself, but the insect. And that's where you treat the, the crawlers. The, that's the, the baby scale, that's what they're called. So, <clears throat> Uh, one thing that you want to avoid when you do have a scale infestation is fertilizing because the nitrogen from the fertilizer will just feed them. It's like giving, giving the insect vitamins. So that'll actually increase the, the um, population. You know, they'll, it'll make them even healthier. They just love it. So you want to get the, the insect in control, um, suppress the insect before you start trying to bring the plant back and recovering the plant through fertilization. And then this is where I was just talking about the growth regulator and how it's a, trying to um, control it. This is actually one scale right here. I think this is, uh, gosh, what is it? I don't think it's lacanium. I can't tell with it that close. It might be lacanium, but that shell is actually kind of hard. Um, you can tap on it. It's, you know, it's a hard shell. So when there, there's a soft mass underneath there, but it spray won't, you won't get any contact on it. But once they start having their, the babies or the crawlers, they come out and they, to spread. And that's when they're most vulnerable. Um, another, pests that we're seeing a lot of are boars, especially ambrosia beetles. And it seems like every year I'm starting to see more ambrosia beetles in the early spring. Um, generally the first infestation is occurring, this year it was early March where I saw them, and they'll attack a wide host of plants. Um, that's the beetle itself. I mean, it's fairly enlarged there. Uh, when you see the hole, it's just the, it's about the size of a pencil lead. It's a very small insect and they bore into the tree and you'll see sawdust sometimes if you catch them early. And there's a lot of different types of ambrosia beetles. So this is where I was talking about. That is a very fresh or active infestation. When you start seeing those, that frass or the sawdust poking out of the hole and it looks like a pencil lead. That beetle's in there pushing it out right now. They're mass attacking that tree. Um, the other picture is the same. Uh, it's a different type of ambrosia beetle, but it's causing the, it's a different reaction where it's causing the sap to run out a little bit on the plant. But this is what we see typically around here. I only catch those frass tubes or that the, where they're pitching it out very rarely that you'll see it because it doesn't take long. Just the slightest wind will blow that down. But you, if you look at the base of the tree, you'll see all of it. So those are some of the species that uh, ambrosia beetles will attack. There's certain plants in the landscape that if I'm on their property on a regular basis, you know, we're doing preventative spray treatments. Certain plants I'll treat regardless if they, you know, before they get infested just to prevent it. Um, beech trees, coosa dogwoods are highly susceptible, um, but yellow wood I would think, or I would say is probably the most vulnerable or susceptible um, than any of the other insects <clears throat> or any of the other species, I'm sorry. Um, 
caterpillars. Um, they were another problem this year. Uh, bagworms last year and this year were heavier than I've ever seen them. Again, I'm not really sure why, just maybe the milder winters that we've been having, uh, but there's just been a tremendous amount of bagworms. And these are arborvitae and all those little bags on there, those little cones are the, the insect. And it's a pretty nifty little caterpillar because they create their bag. They start feeding on the plant and they create a bag and just stay on the plant itself. And most people don't even realize they have them until they get fairly large late in the season. And then it's really hard. It's pretty much too late or they, the plant's completely defoliated, but it's hard to control them. And then if they go undetected, the females actually lay their eggs right in that bag. Um, so the following year, they'll be even thicker. Uh, we'll have two to 300 eggs, I think, in each little sack. So they spread pretty quickly. <clears throat> and then there's other um, caterpillars that we deal with. Um, it's fine. The gypsy moth, fall webworm. We haven't had, I haven't seen gypsy moth infestations in quite some time. Uh, I think the last one I saw was in, in Delaplain actually, and it was a few years ago. But what has been a, a pretty recent new pest um, or cat, it's a caterpillar, it's called fall webworm. And this is different than the Eastern tent caterpillar that you see in the early spring that's on cherries. Uh, Eastern tent caterpillar is typically, you'll find that in the crotches or the forks of trees and fall webworm uh, occurs out on the tips of the branches and it'll wrap itself, the web will uh, wrap itself around the, the branch ends and the foliage. It's not as damaging to the plant because it's so, it occurs so late in the season. I start seeing this generally around late July, August, September timeframe. And it's more of a cosmetic problem versus a health problem, but it's become so heavy that it's really a, an eyesore. I mean, this plant on the, the side there, I mean, they just look terrible. And you talk about people crawling. So they just, freak out about this insect because it's so visible. And I'll treat it sometimes, but generally, it, the insect itself doesn't live that long, actually. They create that web and they're gone. So most of the time, I'm just seeing the webs and the caterpillars not even active anymore. <laughs> See it on walnut? Um, it used to just be honey locust. Honey locust is a big um, mimosa, is a fall webworm, mimosa webworm. Um, but I'm seeing it now on a lot of different species. See it on certain shrubs too, like barberry. You see it on barberry a lot in Catonia, not Catonia, it's for barberry. But I've definitely noticed it on a lot more tree species this year. Flower and cherries, I saw it, which is unusual. All right. So the spotted lanternfly, this is probably the, the most exciting or the, the biggest insect in this um, that's going on right now. Um, has anybody seen it? Have y'all seen one yet in, in real life? So they're not here. They're not in Warren County yet, I don't believe. Um, or if they have, they haven't been found. Uh, they're pretty prevalent in um, Winchester. Frederick County, and now they've moved to Clark County. Um, it's it's not a cat, or it's not a, a moth. It's actually a plant hopper. So a lot of people call it a a, a moth, but it's not. It's a pretty. It's a, an attractive insect. So um, so the first time it was found, I guess, in this area was back in Pennsylvania, or in Pennsylvania in 2014. In 2018, it was found in Winchester, and then last year it was found in Clark County. Um, I believe it was last year. It might have been early this spring. Um, I already mentioned it's a plant hopper. Uh, I think somebody asked earlier, I don't know if I go into this, but it right now the adults are out. Um, 
but the various life cycles is it has four nymph stages. Uh, and then the, right now the adults are laying eggs. So they overwinter as egg masses on the side of trees generally. Um, but one reason why this insect spreads so much is that they'll lay their eggs on anything. So, you know, they could lay their eggs on somebody's car or, you know, campers, anything like that to transport them, crates. Um, is why probably how they came over here or, you know, got introduced here to begin with. It's a non-native pest. And most of these pests that I, I don't think I've mentioned, but most of the pests that we're talking about tonight are not native to this area. And most of them are, you know, introduced through shipping containers and things like that. <clears throat> so this, um, my colleague took that picture. This is in Winchester. Um, those are on a red maple tree. I don't think that's a red maple, but it's a maple tree. Um, but anyways, they're, uh, those are the adults and they're feeding. The problem with this pest is they, they create a lot of honeydew. They're, they feed, they have a mouth part, they're feeding on the sap. And when they get a heavy enough infestation, I haven't seen this yet myself, but it just, it'll rain. I mean, it literally is just dropping. You know, you can hear the droppings and then everything turns black from the sugar and the, you know, from this in the sooty mold. So that's where it's going to become a really problem. The vineyards or the orchards are really concerned about it. Um, so I think the next slide, well, that's just another picture. That's actually a pretty good picture. So that's one of, that's a female and those are, that's, she's laying her eggs right there. And when she's finished, she'll cover that with kind of like a, it's like a buff colored, um, covering. But right now, those are just individual egg masses that she's laying. So that was a pretty good picture. Um, again, they have a, it's a very wide host. I don't, they definitely like some trees better. Um, Ilanthus, tree of heaven, is their favorite tree, which I'm fine with that. Um, I wish that would be the only thing that they would go after. Uh, but they will eventually, if they get heavy enough, and, and they're going to, it'll be a problem. We're all going to um, see this insect here before long, uh, but it can kill the plants. Vineyards, I mentioned the grapes, they love grapevines and they love apple trees. So it's going to be a, a problem for the, the wineries and the vineyards for sure. Um, and honestly, I don't know when when we're in the height of the infestation, what people are going to do. I mean, I don't think it, it won't be feasible to treat them. You know, you might want to treat certain plants, but um, I guess fortunately I'm not there yet. So I'm not really sure how we're going to handle that. I know we're treating a lot of ornamental trees though right now in, in the Winchester area, specific plants for it. <clears throat> uh, probably the most strike not striking but the the biggest plant or the biggest problem that i've seen this year or the last two years has been oak decline um just huge mature oak trees that suddenly um just suddenly die or die very quickly uh it occurs in both red oaks and white oak trees species um and i say that broadly so all all the white oaks and all the red oaks um but it definitely seems to be more, or it seems to be impacting the red oak family much more so than the white oaks. The white oaks aren't quite as susceptible. Um, the thing with decline is it's not one specific problem that's causing the, the death. It's usually multiple factors. So um, the definition of decline is the loss of vigor and vitality caused by the accumulation of multiple biotic and abiotic stress factors. Uh, so that covers both insects, diseases, um, rain, soil compaction, weather related uh, problems. <clears throat> so this is a picture of an oak that's starting 
well, it's it's in decline. Once they get that thin, there's that tree will be dead within a few years. Once they start flagging out like that or becoming that thin and lose that much foliage, a lot of times we'll see it in the um, more so in the top than just that overall thinning where the top will start to die back. Um, but when they're thin like that, it's definitely a problem. I'm seeing a lot of it in chestnut oaks too now, which chestnut oaks are in the white oak family. Um, but primarily it's red oak, scarlet oak, and black oak. So some of the decline related diseases that we see are phytophthora root rot, uh, bleeding canker, and then armillaria root rot, which were, was on that Siberian elm that I showed you um, previously. Uh, both phytophthora root rot and bleeding canker, bleeding canker is a form of phytophthora. It just shows the symptoms on the trunk versus with phytophthora root rot, it's in the root system. You can't, you don't really see anything. <clears throat> That's a picture of you know the trunk of a tree, and you start see, you see those black lesions. That's the bleeding canker, and once you start seeing that, that tree is in pretty big trouble. Um, once it's that far, you're probably not going to be able to save that tree. If you catch it where there's just a spot or two, you might be able to treat it, um, but. I haven't had a lot of success when it's that when it's covered that far because it's moving into the the plant. It's also in the root system at that point, and <clears throat> with both phytophthora and bleeding canker, especially phytophthora, you'll see um, if we've had a lot of rain, the that'll cause the root rot, and then the we won't start seeing the symptoms until it starts until we get into a dry period because how it affects the fine roots, it kills the fine roots of the plant. And the plant will be healthy as long as there's good water um, saturation or good water, um, it'll be fine. But once, the, once we start to dry out, those roots aren't, um, aren't a, they're not there, so they can't take it up. It's messing me up. <laughs> So this is a picture of the armillaria again, um, a little bit closer up. And that's the, the, the mycelium fans of the, uh, of the shoestring root rot of armillaria also. Some of the insects that are um, creating problems for the oaks. Again, the gypsy moth, we, we're not seeing that now, but with most oak decline, it takes years and years of a number of different problems to start to weaken the tree and then eventually something will finish it off. Um, most of these are secondary pests, especially the wood boring insects and the ambrosia beetles. That tree is already stressed from other reasons or from other factors before the, the wood boring insects move in. So the main thing trying to keep the plants as healthy as possible. Um, you know, if you've got a really nice oak tree or a nice tree that you want to keep healthy, do things to, through like fertilize it, um, pruning, things like that to just try to keep the plant healthy. Don't wait till it gets so sick and then try to save it because it's, it's usually not going to happen. Um, two line chestnut bore is another bore that we've had in this area for, for years and they'll attack oak trees. And if it gets a heavy enough infestation, it'll start causing that dieback and weakening the tree. Um, two line chestnut borer is actually the same genus. So it's the same family as the emerald ash borer um, that we have. I didn't, I'm not gonna talk about the emerald ash borer because most ashes now are, are dead if they hadn't been treated, so but this is a pest that is native to this area and is pretty common, but you don't see it that often. This is a combination of Phytophthora, the bleeding canker, and then 
uh, it's getting attacked by the ambrosia beetles. A lot of times with the, the bleeding canker is it, it reduces a, or emits a pheromone that will attract the insects, the alcohol. So that's why I said it's a secondary pest and the boars are just attracted to it. And then they just move in and they finish it off. <clears throat> a lot of people have been calling me and asking, um, you know, see all these oak trees dying and say, we have oak wilt. Because if you look up um, oak problems on the internet, this is generally what you come up with. Um, to my knowledge, there's not any oak weld in this area. Our office is in Pittsburgh. We deal with it a lot in, in that area, north of here. Oak weld's a big problem. Um, but I've never seen it myself here. I've never collected any samples and had uh, been able to diagnose oak weld. So it's just not a problem in this area, but I thought I would bring it up. Unfortunately, the symptoms of oak wilt are very similar to oak decline where you start getting that tip of die back. And then um, the difference is, is you get the sapwood streaking. So if you peeled the bark off, you would see some streaking with oak wilt. <clears throat> Another uh, disease that's been really prevalent this year is bacterial leaf scorch. Um, and I, I think that it's, again, mostly weather related, you know, 2018 um, and 2000, the spring of 2019, we just had a tremendous amount of rain. And I didn't mention that, but I'm sure that's why all these oaks are dying. Most of the oaks that I'm seeing, the big mature ones are in low lying areas. And almost all of them that I've sampled did have the root rot. But I, I think they were just so saturated for so long in 2018. And now we're just starting to, it took them a couple years to finally die off. Um, and bacterial leaf scorch, the same thing. Um, it's definitely affected by the weather. It's, it's actually transmitted by an insect, by a plant hopper, where they feed on the leaves. But there's a lot of different types of plants that are susceptible. Oak trees, um, maples, sycamore, elms, mulberries. There's a pretty wide host. I've never seen it on mulberry though, or I didn't care. So, um, what you typically see is the leaves late summer. Again, you'll it happens when it starts to dry out. Um, all summer long, or spring and early summer, the plant will look perfectly healthy, and then come, depending on the weather, but usually around um, August you'll start seeing the, the margins of leaves start to turn brown and they'll start to defoliate, drop early. And that's a, that's a sign of, of bacterial leaf scorch. Eventually it'll, plant, it'll kill the plant. Um, it'll weaken it enough. It takes a long time. There are some treatments for it. Um, they've gotten better. I don't think they're great. So, and then these are just different plants. They, that's typically what you see. That's a fairly healthy oak. Um, and then late summer, it just turned that reddish color and that thing will defoliate in a, generally a few weeks, usually once it gets to that point. Um, that's the vector. That's what causes it. So when they feed on the tree, they carry the, the, the disease that causes bacterial leaf scorch. <clears throat> and I already mentioned that you start seeing the symptoms uh, that they become more effective or not more effective, but you start seeing the symptoms during a drought. So the main thing with bacterial leaf scorch is trying to plant trees that are, are resistant to it or not susceptible. Um, sanitation, meaning pruning out any diseased uh, branches or dying branches. Um, the vector management is, that's kind of difficult, but that's where you're going after the leaf hopper um, to control it or uh, chemotherapy or bacistat. That's actually 
I should change that. That's a little bit older. We're using a different product now um, that we're injecting the trees. It's uh, it's a antibiotic or arborbiotic. So the main thing is stay away from red oaks in general. Um, red oaks, pin oaks, black oaks, scarlet oaks are all highly susceptible. Schumard oak, they're not sure about, but I have seen it on Schumard oak, um, unfortunately. Um, Sawtooth, English and willow oaks are, are fine. White oaks aren't nearly as susceptible. So, and then avoid planting any platinus, which is um, sycamore. I put this slide in here. This is talking about um, glyphosate, which a lot of people are round up, have moved away from using it in general, but it still boggles my mind that they sell this extended life roundup because I'll go and look at trees and it'll be just completely dead and you know I'll look around and there aren't any weeds or anything and I said well have you applied any herbicide and they'll say well yeah I just applied some the extended life roundup to it or to kill the weeds around the plant well the problem with the extended life roundup is it goes into the soil and it kills the roots most Roundup or like regular Roundup doesn't. Um, the only way that regular Roundup will kill the plant is you have to spray the foliage. But any of those extended Roundups or the ones that say that they'll last for 24 uh, months or 12 months, I guess, they have a different, uh, they have multiple herbicides in them and they'll definitely damage plants. So we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of plants being killed by Roundup. Now, that's just a picture um, that those two trees that was from Roundup. So just be careful as far as reading the label. Um, glyphos glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup, but that amazapir, which is the second one, is the active ingredient that's doing the damage. So just be very careful if you're gonna use any of those extended control roundups. Mm -hmm. You've gotta be careful with triclopyr too. It's pretty, it'll. I believe it's used on tree stumps and it'll, control through both foliage and, but I know you can do stump applications with triclopyr. No, not if you put it on the stump itself and not in the soil. All right, and I think this is the last little series of slides here, but, um, root collar problems are always an issue with plants. And I see all varieties of, of mulching practices out there. Um, this one's pretty common, the, where they pile the mulch all the way up on top of the tree. Uh, I call it, well, call it volcano mulching, but it creates a lot of problems for the plant. There's, um, it can cause, well, first it holds too much moisture right around the base of the plant itself. It can cause the roots to come to the surface and then they'll just encircle the tree and cause girdling roots where the, the tree will choke itself out or the roots will choke the tree out. Um, so you want to avoid that. The next picture there is actually a, a tree that doesn't have any mulch, but it also doesn't have any kind of a root flare. If you look at it, it kind of looks like a telephone pole sticking in the ground instead of a a normal tree that flares out at the base. So if you if you see a tree like that, over time that tree is going to start to to decline and eventually it'll die. We've seen trees that actually just fall over like that, you know. So you've got to be careful as far as you know for us working on them. If we see a tree like that, and that one's pretty small, but larger trees that do make it 
you know, I've heard stories where they just, they come over and, you know, it could be dangerous. So that's another tree that it's a fairly young tree where it doesn't have a, a very good root flare. Um, a lot of times that first picture where the mulch was mounted up, you know, I'll, I'll tell people, it's like, well, the best thing you could do is pull all that mulch and soil back and I'll go back and they've scraped off an inch of the mulch and you still got, you know, two feet of dirt. Um, but you've got to really, if to expose the root flare, you really got to pull it back um, until you see those buttress roots. <clears throat> so this is a tree that is being planted. Um, and it's just showing, you can see the dirt line up high. It's probably six to eight inches of soil that was removed off of the top of that root ball to get it to the proper height. So that's why a lot of times, you know, you'll see that the plants are planted incorrectly and people don't realize it. You get a, a tree from a nursery, either in a container or a bald and burlap, and it comes from the nursery with too much soil around the base. So it's really important to expose that root flare at the time you plant the tree. And then that rake across there is just to measure, you know, to, so you can see the height of it and you want that flare to be level with the soil and then you can apply mulch back on top of that, you know, maybe two to three inches, but not piled up all around the trunk of the tree. And then that's a fairly large oak there, but that's the root flare, those, those buttress roots that you wanna see exposed. You know, if you look at a tree in the woods, they're all, they're never buried, you know. <clears throat> and then that's a, a young tree with a, a nice root flare that was pulled back. So basically you want to avoid the volcano mulching and just have the mulch spaced out. Oh. That was the last slide anyways. There was, only, there was only one more. But the, a lot of times people ask me, what size mulch ring do you want? And <laughs> That's um, that's a little bit excessive, but uh, that's what the tree would like. I mean, that's actually more beneficial for the tree than having the soil or the lawn around it. Um, but the more mulch that you can have around the tree, the better it's going to be because the lawn's just going to compete for both water and nutrients. So. No, but what does it have? So competition in the woods, there's, I, we're kind of talking about two different things, but the competition in the woods, um, you're not going to get a big spreading tree with, because of the competition. They're going to grow up towards the light, but they'll be fine. The reason why mulch is beneficial in the urban landscape when, in lawns is it adds nutrients back to the soil the organic matter breaks down. And that's what we're taking away when we plant trees in the lawn versus what you have um, in the woods. You've got the, the leaves decomposing and then adding nitrogen back to the soil naturally. Did that answer your question? Sure. because they'll just naturally break down every year. So, I mean, it's ideal. Well, yes, I mean, anytime, any cultural practice, whenever you're dealing with any kind of disease, you know, the best thing to do is to remove disease branches or the foliage or needles that are falling so it's not spreading. <clears throat> Okay. Okay, so what do you do with a sour cherry that drops, the, the fruit drops before they become mature? 
Um, typically, well, it could be a couple different things. Most of the time it's brown rot. So if the fruit is turning brown and then it just drops, that's the fungus. Um, if, if they set, the trees will thin themselves if they have too much fruit. So some of that dropping is natural, but do they recall if it was brown? Most of the time when fruit drops mature or prematurely on cherry trees is brown rot, which is a fungus. So what you would do though, is you would have to spray it and you need to spray preventatively early in the spring, well before the fruit is set. Because once the fruit's set, it's too late. And just a general, you know, fungicide that's good for, for fruit trees would be effective for that. <clears throat> too much rain will cause fruit to drop too sometimes um, with cherries also. But I bet it was brown rot if I had to guess. Any others? Mm -hmm. No, there's act. Pardon me. Oh. Uh, whether or not the native dogwood is, is recommended because of the dogwood and thracnose. There for a while, uh, we got away from recommending the Cornus Florida because of dogwood and thracnose. But it seems like some of the plants are, a lot of them did survive and there seems to build some resistance to the anthracnose now. So I wouldn't hesitate to plant native dogwoods, but they also have introduced some varieties that they're crossing with the Cornus Cusa and Cornus Florida, which is the Cusa dogwood and our native dogwood that are resistant. So to answer your question is yes, I would plant a native dogwood or, or one of these newer varieties. I, I prefer them actually. I think that it's a much prettier plant. Do I have special advice for peach trees? Um, stone fruit in general, um, along with the cherry trees, are probably the toughest fruit trees to grow, especially in this area. They, they do well, but they do require uh, spraying if you want to try to get a good fruit crop. So, you know, pruning, but having them on a, a, a spray program is pretty critical because they get a lot of different types of insects and disease that will attack them. Uh, between brown rot, peach leaf curl, um, and the, there's a bore that attacks them, peach tree bore, that's really hard on peach trees. So I think that most of the peach orchards, they treat their trees like 14 times in a season. So peach trees are finicky. You don't have to prune, or you don't have to treat them that many times, though, to have a successful crop. But I was just, that's what the commercial orchards do. They treat them that often. <clears throat> I have peach trees, but the bears eat them every year, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, t I don't, I'm not even going to spray them anymore. I don't care if they get a good peach. <laughs> They eat them about the size when they're barely the size of a pit. Oh, it makes me mad. Good. All right. Thank you.